Welcome into Big Ten Today. I'm Dave Revson. Joshua Perry, Dave Wanstead, join me in just a bit. But this is a special day for us here at the Big Ten Network as we celebrate the 15th anniversary of our launch. Here is what it looked like when we hit the air for the first time on this day in 2007. The Big Ten Network will capture the power, the passion, and the pageantry of the Big Ten better than any other network that has come before us. With that, I'd like everyone to help count down with us tonight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Eleven schools, 252 varsity teams, one great network to cover it all. Welcome to the Big Ten Network, your ultimate source for Big Ten sports, featuring the games, passion, and tradition of the nation's foremost athletic conference. I'm Dave Revson, and this is Big Ten Tonight. In the next hour, we'll get you ready for the conference football season. And joining me to do that, our studio analyst, Jerry DiNardo, former coach at three BCS conference schools, most recently at Indiana, and Howard Griffith, former star running back at the University of Illinois. Michigan has to replace seven defensive stars. They have not done that yet. Wisconsin, they're going to try to make a championship run with our rookie quarterback. That's difficult to do. And Ohio State has to replace a whole lot of star power, Howard, including a Heisman Trophy quarterback. Well, Coach, you're dead on with those top three. But there's another eight teams out there that are looking to make that jump. And two come to mind, Penn State, in Iowa. They are ready to jump into that next group uh, of athletes and teams. Then I want to talk about Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota. These are teams that are going to have some big upsets this year. Go. Huh. Thoughts, what do you look at that? I'm going oh. by Howard Griffith and Jerry DiNardo, as you may have guessed. <laughs> is it, is a, this a family show? Is a, <laughs> Howard, I'll let you start. You okay. on the floor. Okay, so, so yeah. first of all, I think a little behind the scenes. Here. Okay. This is a very nervous day. It was a nervous day. While Mark Silverman and the big suits were down there having an enjoyable evening of dinner, we were up here nervous Nellies, didn't know what was getting ready to happen. But now I know why we couldn't go. Did you see my face? I had to be close to 300 pounds, <laughs> so maybe they were doing me a favor. But no, I, I say this, to be a part of a network that had an opportunity to start where we start and still be here yeah. is really significant because you think about when we first started to meet the coaches, not all the coaches believed that this was the right thing to do and this was really going to work. But because we've been as consistent as we are, we've been able to make inroads and we've made relationships with coaches and programs that continue to last to the 16th year that we've just gone out this summer. So I'm so excited to have been a part of this and continue to be a part of it. I had done some radio. I had not done any studio work. And I can remember uh, after the first show, uh, we, got, we went by our cubicles and I said, What's a rundown? <laughs> <laughs> because because any time I ask the producer a question, he'd say, it's in the it's rundown. In the rundown. <laughs> it's in the rundown. And I can remember Mark Silverman, I, and you too, you were probably laughing at me. <laughs> we actually went over to someone's computer, and we went through what a rundown was. I, I had never heard of one, of, had never seen one. And then you thought B-roll, you wanted to call it bro. Bro. Well, yeah. I think, you, no, you revolutionized the business that with stuff. that. Bro. I mean, <laughs> it's really it, that's bro. Bro. It, that's it, yeah, bro. It, well, aside from the launch, what's your most vivid memory of those early days? Not necessarily year one, but kind of the, the early years of the Big Ten Network. Well, getting to know you two guys, because we were together so much, the tour was always something special. Even the first year, there wasn't a camera. And, I mean, I think most people that watch us say, oh, you guys have great chemistry. I mean, we get that a lot, right? If it hadn't been for the tour, I mean, we didn't, you and I had worked together, but yeah. we, the three of us hadn't been together. And I almost didn't get the job because, you know, I, I told people I like Mexican food, and <laughs> you really were upset with me about that. So they almost didn't hire me because of it. I don't remember. That could have been an Italian food thing. It <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 gets parochial <laughs> about cuisines, as we all know. But you know yeah. what? I, I think what you did mention about the tour, the way we've been able to connect with, with schools and with head coaches, 
that really allowed us ultimately to be able to connect, right? And we all have our, our quirks, but we know each other and we know what those quirks are. And to me, that really plays out on the television screen. The, the tour is so cool because I think one of the things, just being at this network that was different from the previous job that I had where I was in studio far away from the events that were happening, is that we get to visit with student athletes, mm -hmm. we get to right. visit with coaches. You really get to know them. Yeah. And you feel so much more a part of these programs, right? I mean, we know, we don't just know the head coaches and some players, we know trainers, and we know obviously SIDs and support staff. And that part of it has been so rewarding to kind of see those people through the years and to really feel like we don't just cover these programs, but we're kind of a part of them too. Yeah, I mean, we're business partners actually, right? right. I mean, the way the thing is set up between the, the network and the conference office. Um, but but the friendships we've made and the non-traditional way that we'll see things that we're only allowed to see because we're in a non-traditional network and we respect that and we would we would nobody has to tell us if we shouldn't say something we, <laughs> right, we know right. you know not that anything bad's going on yeah. but a trick play or a cane I mean we have access to a lot of information that could be valuable and we would never ever break that trust yeah I think that's significant as well but I go to you Reverend when you talk about getting a chance particularly now that we do have been doing the um, recruiting show for so long but you get that opportunity to see these guys as juniors and seniors in high school and then you see them go out and make plays at the college level and really the one of the names that just comes to mind right now for me is Denard Robinson watching him come into Michigan as a true freshman and really just trying to figure it out. Then all of a sudden he gets the opportunity to speak on behalf of the student athletes. <clears throat> when he had to follow up a guy by Kirk Cousins the year before, whose speech was unbelievable. Yeah, it was fabulous. But Denard was authentic about who he was and what the college experience has meant to him. And it's so many of those stories that we get a chance to see. How about when we go to practice and we, and we, we watch James Laronitis play linebacker and then he sits on the desk? <laughs> how, about, how about Marcus Freeman at yeah. Purdue for yeah. Daryl Hazel? Yeah. We're watching him coach linebackers and we're saying, that guy can coach. Yeah. Now, did we think he'd be the head coach at Notre Dame at 37? Probably yeah. not. Yeah. Probably not. But, uh, again, it's the unusual, non-traditional yeah part of media that, that we are. No, that part of it has been really cool. I mean, Joshua Perry is so right, another right, yeah, right. interviewed, right? I mean, he, Brock Vereen played at Minnesota. I mean. No, no, I know that that part of it is, is amazing and maybe just states how old we are. But but I also think kind of this notion of we came into this thing and we didn't really, first of all, as, as you said, Jerry, we didn't know one another. Certainly neither of us mm. knew Howard yet. But also just kind of this notion that, that this was a trailblazing network that you know, there were a lot of doubters about what we were doing as a network, about the, the whole thing, whether this would work. And then you mm -hmm. think about where it is now and that all the imitators, right? I mean, that, that everyone kind of jumped on board. I mean, I don't think I understood the significance of it. I don't know how you could have at the time. You know, from a personal part, uh, I've been involved with college football since 1971, longer than you guys, right? So I've seen the, the, the cut in scholarships and then I coach and see, and see, and then I get in this business and, and what you said, starting this network, has changed college football, right? Yeah. If, if it wasn't for us, there's no SEC network, there's no ACC sure. network, there's no Pac-12 network. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, it has been a fabulous ride. Here's to another 15 years. Oh, you, you've, got, you've got our negotiations knocked out. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying there's nowhere <laughs> I'd rather be 15 years from now. Let's keep it rolling. Right here at this desk with the two of you, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with both of you, and I value your friendships greatly. And, and, and honored to be part of uh, year 16 now. Back at you, hosty. Told you guy wasn't going to cry. 15 years ago today, we launched the Big Ten Network. A few things have changed from the price of gas to the conference affiliation of several Big Ten schools. Jim Harbaugh was starting a new venture on the West Coast. Ryan Day was a little-known wide receivers coach out east. Tom Brady was quarterbacking in the NFL. No, wait, that hasn't changed. And uh, we all lined up to see super bad. Uh, pleased to be joined by Hall of Fame football coach Barry Alvarez. He is today's big interview. Uh, coach, I, I do want to talk to you about the beginning of the college football season and all that in a bit. But as we said, special day for us here at the Big Ten Network. And, of course, you've been associated with the Big Ten 
the entire time, and in fact, long before the Big Ten Network originated. Do you remember the first time you heard about the notion of a potential Big Ten Network? Yeah, I do remember, and I remember Jim Delaney bringing it to the athletic directors, and, uh, you know, I thought it was a, a wonderful idea, but maybe a pipe dream. You know, didn't know whether uh, that something like that was possible. Had never been done before. But, uh, you know, Jim, in his way, you, you felt confident he can get things done. It was well thought out. The first year was a little bit rocky. What do you remember? I mean, you were only the AD at that point. You obviously had a, a brief time where you were the head coach and the AD. But at this point, you're, you're solely in, in the AD spot and Brett had taken over as head coach. What do you remember about being the athletic director at that time when the distribution challenges were kind of front page news seemingly yeah. every day? Yeah, you know what, Jim worked very hard and, and, and the rest of the athletic directors, some of the states, uh, the, cable, the, the cable companies that had some of the states um, uh, weren't committing to uh, the Big Ten network on basic cable, which was very important to Jim and ended up being very important when we started. But I remember going to the state legislature with Jim and uh, talking to them about the network. And I, I know we went around to, to all the other, the other states and, and, and with the other athletic, some of the other athletic directors and did the same thing. Because in our people, you know, in our state, our, our cable companies were not going to carry it or didn't carry it when it initially started. And there was an uproar and I'm getting calls and letters and and a lot of criticism that our people in, in our state weren't getting it. So uh, we had to hang tough and, and and all battle together. And that's the thing. Jim could get consensus and and get everyone on the same page and work together and, and, and all pull together to get, to get something done. And that's what we were able to do. Yeah, it took about a year. So in the subsequent 14 years where the Big Ten Network has had full distribution, in what ways have you seen it make an impact at the university level? Well, I said from the very beginning, I thought it would help in recruiting. The exposure that you get uh, across the country, uh, you know, we, we have more uh, alumni, Big Ten alumni than any other any other conference and people that are interested uh, in, in, in Big Ten schools. But wherever you are, you have access to, to watch our, you know, watch our product. Uh, whether it be uh, football, basketball, volleyball, uh, what's going on in our league, which was very unique. We were the only ones doing that. Uh, so, you know, the front porch, each school, the, fr the, the front porch of every school was, was being broadcast uh, around the country. And so it really helped in recruiting. As you coaches went into living rooms, you sat there and you could talk to the parents I know you're far away, but you're going to be able to watch and play every game. Um, but those things were important. And, you know, and, and, and I think from the very beginning, the talent that we had on the network, we didn't come in and, and, and look like a brand new network. We looked like a quality network uh, with the talent led by yourself, Dave, and, and, uh, uh, and, and just the, the production and everything else was top quality from day one. Well, really kind of you to say the checks in the mail. Uh, you have uh, you have been a in all seriousness, you've been a great advocate for and supporter of the network through the years. Really, very much appreciate it. I do want to switch gears I, as I think through the Big Ten Network era. We've been through so many changes in college football, and of course, you've had a front row seat for so many of them, including the college football playoff. And you served on the very first CFP committee. And I know you still take a keen interest in kind of the evolution of the CFP. What do you think is the right number for the CFP? I know it's more than four. <laughs> that, that's what I know. Um, you know, I, I hear coaches talking 16. I thought 12 maybe was too many. But I, uh, the more I think about it, I think 12 might be the right number. Uh, you can get, get whether you guarantee the the conference champions or not. Um, but, but I think we need more access to it. And, you know, right now you hear people talking, you hear the talking heads, you know, they're talking about schedules as I'm listening. Uh, you know, you're talking about games that are being played and they're talking about 
them being eliminated from the playoffs in the first and second week of the season if, if they lose a game. I don't think that's good for college football. And so if we increase the number, let's say you go to 12 uh, or, or 8, whatever, whatever it might be, um, that doesn't happen. You can lose a game, maybe lose two games and still have an opportunity to, to qualify and, and, and be involved in the playoffs. So uh, I, I just think we, we need more access. Well, that bothers me too, Coach. It bothers me from a slightly different angle, and I'm actually interested as you kind of think back to the origins of the CFP and what the committee talked about in terms of qualification. I seem to recall when this was first being talked about, there was this notion that strength of schedule was really going to be emphasized, and I thought we would get a lot of blockbuster non-conference games. We don't really have those. I mean, there's a few, right? We're going to have Notre Dame, Ohio State this weekend. That'll be great. Alabama's playing Texas, Oregon's going to play Georgia. There are a few every year, but for exactly the reason you're talking about, because you're disincentivized from scheduling difficult games because for whatever reason, the committee's never chosen a team that's lost two games. You lose yeah. two games and you are done. Do the criteria need to change? I mean, was there, did you believe that strength of schedule would be a bigger component of this than it has proven to be? I will tell you this, in the years that I I was in the committee or on the committee. Strength of schedule was very important. I know the one year I, I felt strongly that that Michigan State uh, sh should be involved. I, I, I was a proponent of Michigan State, but their strength of schedule at that particular time compared to the other schools was not as good. And I think you know, and I know that 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 played a factor. So uh, I, I know when I was on the committee, strength of schedule. It is one of the criteria, and it was it was a, a top one of the top priorities as we compared to schools. The other thing that has changed so dramatically in the Big Ten Network era is NIL. Where do you think we are in NIL right now, and uh, in terms of finding a solution that can work best for everyone? Yeah, I, I think as we move forward, things will settle down, and we can get some guardrails. Um, we have to get it out of the out of recruiting, and then I think things will settle. And, and you know what? I, I see some of the things that are happening, and and uh, as far as players in advertisements and 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 doing promotions for companies, et cetera, I think that's wonderful for them to be able to pick up and and make money using their name. That that's only right. But we have to get it out of recruiting. And the NC two A, if they're going to be, if they're going to be, you know our administrators and and enforce the, the rules. We have rules. They have to enforce them to get it out of recruiting. And I think everything else will start settling down. And uh, I think some of the schools, I, I know we have and the schools I'm reading about in our league, they're doing a nice job of, of educating our players and showing them how to take advantage of their, their name, image and likeness and, and how you can use that to your benefit. And uh, hopefully they've they've done the same thing as far as managing money and, and and taking care of their you know taking care of their business. I keep thinking about how well it could have gone for Ron Dane in Dane County, right? Oh I mean, you, you want to talk missed opportunities? <laughs> Let me leave you with this on the Badgers. What are you most interested in seeing Saturday night against Illinois State? Well, you know, you always think you know what your team's going to be like and and the quality of your team, but you still have to get out in front of the people. You know, you've got a lot of guys that haven't been in front of a crowd and how they're going to respond and how you're going to play together. You know, I think we've, for the most part, we've got a pretty veteran team, but I, I'd like to see us take a step. And you, you always want to come out of that first game with a clean performance, uh, not sloppy. Uh, just just play, come out with a clean performance, and and uh, and I think we'll be pretty, pretty, pretty in pretty good shape. Uh, looking forward to watching the Badgers and the rest of the Big Ten coming up week one this weekend. Barry Alvarez, Hall of Famer, still serving the Big Ten as a special advisor to Commissioner Kevin Warren. Coach, thanks so much. Always great to visit with you and to pick your brain. Absolutely, Dave. Have a good day. Of course, leads into a big week of Big Ten football as we do, as promised. Welcome, We're here. Dave Wansett <laughs> and Joshua Perry in. Uh, guys, the, the biggest game of the weekend is Notre Dame against Ohio State. I, I want to focus in from, from the Buckeyes' point of view, Joshua, the biggest things that you'll be watching for. A lot of people are going to have their eyes on that Ohio State defense, and we've heard all offseason long about Jim Knowles 
bringing in this aggressive style of defense. The safeties are going to be rolling. The D linemen are going to be slanting. Linebackers are going to be running through gaps. And everybody wants to see how that actually looks in real time. And I think the biggest key for the Buckeyes this weekend is playing clean football. When you're an aggressive team, it's a double-edged sword because you create a lot of negative plays. But on the back end, you can cut guys loose at times. You'd be people running free in the secondary. So if you're Ohio State, I think the biggest area of focus should be playing a clean game defensively, making sure that none of those explosives happen. And you're able to wrangle in this Notre Dame offense. And of course, they're going to be breaking in a new quarterback. And, uh, you know, you ask about the skill that they have on the edges, but it's still going to be a challenge for Ohio State. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, we were talking earlier, you know, as, as an ex-defensive guy, you know, I would write on the board, don't get bored. And right now, Jim Knowles, you know, he had great success. He took Duke into the top 25 mm -hmm. in defense. Mm -hmm. And what he was known for at Oklahoma State, I mean, they were third in the nation in third down defense. They were number one with quarterback hits. So just to Joshua's point, I mean, he wants to be aggressive. But you got better athletes at, at Ohio State than you did at Oklahoma State. I would tell him, don't get bored. Mm -hmm. Let's give these guys a chance to play fast and and we don't have to be great week one let's just be good what do you mean by don't get bored well coaches get in there and they get bored oh we, we, let's just add this let's add this oh, i got you, add, so, you know. so do what you do yeah, and do you don't well. have to do too much clear right. clear right. mind i'm going to tell you this every week wherever pay attention clear <laughs> mind means fast <laughs> clear mind means fast feet let me just jot it down <laughs> cloudy, <laughs> cloudy mind means slow feet could you imagine coach in the meeting room and that's what we're talking about right here no i'm serious but you mentioned notre dame and i'll be real curious you know two things with marcus freeman that was a tough tough loss in that mm -hmm. bowl game, right? To right. Oklahoma State. Against the same defense, that's Against right. Against the same defense, and how do you get that out of your gut? The only way you do is to get a win. This is a tough one for him to open up with, obviously, with a quarterback, Tyler Buckner, who you know was a backup behind Jack Cohen, and his whole history, 300 yards passing, three touchdowns, three interceptions, you know, he, they they better play great defense. Well, he's more the change of pace runner, but I mean, he's a heavily recruited kid, and I think there was this sense that he was going to be kind of the the heir apparent. Just needed mm -hmm. a little bit of time to to get ready. But I mean, that's where it's so interesting, right? You have the inexperience at quarterback with Notre Dame. You have Ohio State breaking in a, a new defense. Notre Dame's breaking in a, a new defense, too, and they have, you know, Al Golden kind of who is well-respected, right, as a veteran yep. Yep. defensive coordinator. But holy cow, I mean, you've got to figure out a way to game plan <laughs> against what was the most explosive offense by yardage mm -hmm. in Big Ten history last year. Averaged the most yards per game of any team in the history of the Big Ten. So that's a huge challenge, an area where it feels like Ohio State has a decided advantage as talented as Notre Dame is on defense. There will be an advantage for Ohio State, and we know the cast of characters that are coming back, but this is the first game of the year, and, and you're used to ramping up into the season, and Ohio State is going to feel resistance offensively from game one. So the question now is with some veteran guys who have played football, where are your answers coming from? C.J. Stroud out there as a quarterback has to have answers to adjust on the fly, make some audibles. If you're Travion Henderson, it might not be blocked up perfectly. They've got really good players on the other side for Notre Dame, so you're going to have to break a few tackle, uh, tackles. Excuse me. And for Jackson Smith and Jigba, it's the same thing. Contested catches. And I know Notre Dame probably wants to get better in that secondary, but you're probably going to feel more coverage than you felt in previous games. And so as much as Ohio State does have that advantage, they're playing Notre Dame. There is resistance on the other side. Yeah, and I got to make this point. In the first three games, and, and we've studied this, the special teams normally have as big an influence on winning and losing early as offense and defense. So special teams with both of these both of these ball clubs, keep an eye on that. That will be a factor in this game. The special teams coordinator from Notre Dame came over from Ohio State. He was a GA there many years ago, so he's kind of got a beat on, on how the special teams game goes there. I do want to dive into the Penn State-Purdue game. It's an enormous game. It's an enormous game for both these teams. I mean, for Penn State, 11-11 the last couple of years, they want to be thought of in the same vein as Michigan and Ohio State, the teams that everyone's talking about at top the East, and this would be a great way to kind of send themselves in that direction. For Purdue, this is a season of massive expectations, guys, and it feels like it just aligns perfectly for you. You get to play a home game with a huge TV audience at night. Yep. 
it, it's going to be an amazing atmosphere. Let's start with the Boilers. What will you be focused on the most for them? Well, first off, I think you're absolutely spot on with the atmosphere, everything on this game. And it's going to tell us a lot about Big Ten races, I think, uh, this early on in the season. But when you look at Purdue, there's one thing that is certain is George Karloftis is not walking into that locker room. Right. And they had some monumental strides on the defensive side of the ball a year ago, and now they're going to have to repeat that level of production without one of the top players in all of America from a year ago. So I'm curious to see what exactly that defensive line rotation looks like. And when we saw them in training camp, we felt like they did have more depth than they've had up front before. And then as a secondary, you have to adjust now to a little bit of different timing because that ball might not be coming out nearly as quickly. Uh, and so this is going to be a fun one. Now, when you look at the, the lines of scrimmage, and we'll kind of dive into it a little bit deeper, if you're Purdue, this might be one of the offensive lines that you want to open up with because we, we know the struggles that Penn State's had in the past. Yeah, and, you know, you, you mentioned Purdue's offense. Um, this is a game where Penn State started fast last year and then when, with the injury, they yes. kind of fell back. And Purdue, on the other hand, they were as good an offense. And, in fact, O'Connell, the quarterback, he, Aiden, he was second in the Big Ten the last five weeks. He was, he was up there nationally with yes. all statistics. And everyone's talking about, well, they lost their top three receivers, which they did. But you got to look at that bowl game. A lot of those guys didn't play, and they had they had Brock Thompson caught two touchdown passes yeah. as a backup. All of a sudden, Payne, uh, Payne Bur Durham. Bur Dur Dur Durham. He, Durham, he goes in and catches two touchdowns as a backup. These guys are all back, and then they got the transfer players we're yes. talking about, right? From Iowa and Auburn. So there's a I don't see them falling off, and and they got their leading rusher back for the second year in a row. So they will be able to be balanced if they want and run the ball somewhat. You know, the, the wide receivers, I think you make a really good point there because you talk about uh, Tyrone Tracy Jr. coming in and Charlie Jones. Those are names that we know. We've seen the level of production. You mentioned Brock Thompson, and it wasn't just a bowl game. I thought that he had some moments last year that were really good, but the tight end, Payne Durham, I think is going to be a big part of this game plan. And when you're breaking in new receivers – there's nothing like having that big body that's typically in the middle of the field right over the football that you can just dump it down to. And we know that ball comes out quickly uh, for Purdue. So I think they've got some options here. Yeah. Very quickly, quick thought on Penn State. The, the biggest thing you're watching for Penn State is what? Offensive line, 100%. If they can run the football, if they can keep Sean Clifford healthy, I think this becomes a better year. How about for you? Biggest thing with Penn State? Manny Diaz, new defensive coordinator. has been a coordinator for 14 years, ex-head coach of Miami. What are they going to do differently from a really, really top 10 defense a year ago? Yes, they've lost some players, but, but, but how is he going to bring this group together and bring them together fast? Yeah, tough challenge against yeah. Jeff Brom's offense. That, yep. is, that is no easy assignment <laughs> for your first game as a defensive coordinator, but again, a veteran guy in Manny Diaz. Celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Big Ten Network today, here is who was in charge of the conference's 11 football teams on launch day. Sadly, a couple have passed away, Joe Paterno and Joe Tiller. It was Mark D'Antonio's first season in East Lansing, Lloyd Carr's last in Ann Arbor. Three coaches still in the league, although one, Brett Bielema, has obviously switched schools. But Kirk Ferentz still at Iowa and Pat Fitzgerald still at Northwestern. He coached his 200th game Saturday, a win over Nebraska in Ireland. And Pat Fitzgerald fresh off the airplane late yesterday afternoon back in the office today kind enough to join us a coach first off how's the body clock how are you adjusting slept really well last night dave uh it was <laughs> I, I think i woke up in a pool of drool to be honest with you uh but uh, it was a great flight back everybody at the Lingus college football classic it was first class event you know obviously a, a hard fought game a really physical game glad we have a bye this week but uh, really proud of our staff with the way that they put everything together. And then obviously our, our players were the ones that made it happen on the field. And the way that way they went about the business trip of, of going over internationally and, and playing a really, I think, really, really talented Nebraska team and finding a way to win in the fourth quarter. I want to get into the game in just a moment, but I want to talk about the aftermath with it first, because that's probably what, what's freshest in your mind. You guys made the choice, obviously, of the bye week, which Nebraska did not have the luxury of having, but you made the choice to stay in Dublin for an extra day. You obviously got to celebrate with your team and their family and some fans as well on Saturday night. Give me a sense of the postgame, both Saturday night and on Sunday. 
yeah, uh, it was, uh, I, I guess I'd call it like Lincoln Park, Wrigleyville, kind of at a higher notch. Uh, <laughs> pretty good. It was great for the guys. They had a blast. And I'm going around the buses yesterday morning and, you know, around breakfast and the plane talking to the guys, just asking them how they last kind of 36 hours were. And they really enjoyed it. And, I, you know, this is what college football is all about. That's why we made the decision to do what we did. Number one, we have the bye. Two, we're not in school. And then three, so many of our guys' families had the opportunity, and we we had heard that they were going to make the trip. So it really started post game. We we hosted about 600 people uh, in in uh, in our team hotel, uh, families, loved ones, our players. It was it was an awesome event after the game, and uh, I think it, it spilled down into Temple Bar. I didn't quite make it down there. Uh, I got a lot of texts from teammates and supporters uh hey where are you at where are you at i'm like i'm going to bed so but it was it was great shared it with my family it was it was a it was a great experience and and i'm sure coach frost if, if we ended up on the short end i would tell you it was a great event uh i'm sure he'd feel the same way just would prefer a win what were you most pleased with on the field on saturday well i you know really we took care of the football uh you know i, I like to really like the way we did that there was the one play that was a great hit by their DB on Cam Porter, but that shows you Cam Porter. I think a different back goes out of bounds on that play, and he's like, well, I'm going to turn my nose, go north, and let's make this play violent, and uh, he'll probably you know, learn from that. But uh, taking care of the ball, taking it away, and then just, you know, I think the consistency that we executed, there were just a handful of plays we'd like to have back, but in the opener with, you know, no scrimmages, no preseason games, you know, to, to, to be able to go out and really execute pretty cleanly. I was very pleased with the job our coaches and most importantly our players did. We played a good portion of your post-game news conference on Saturday, and you said fairly explicitly you didn't want to talk a whole lot about last year. But I do think just to gauge the progress that you've made, you almost have to bring up last year. And the thing that really has stood out to me as I watched the game back here on the Big Ten Network yesterday was how dominant your offensive line was. I mean, it was just fabulous, and it got better and better as the game went on, you obviously have an incredible talent in Peter Skaronsky at left tackle, but it's the rest of the group that was equally as good. To what do you attribute that huge leap? Well, you go back to being in the weight room the whole offseason. You know, a year ago, you know, we'll go back for a second. I mean, that team was out of the weight room for eight-ish months, six to eight months. And as a developmental program, you know, that was killer. And, and, and then, and, you know, we weren't going to make any excuses. We just... You could see the line of scrimmage on both sides and in, in, in uh, 21 get moved in the way you don't want it to get moved. And, and uh, that's not how we're built. That's that's not our, our DNA. And, uh, you know, so Jay Hooten, our strength staff, did a terrific job. But, again, the credit always goes to the players. They they came back in January wanting to restore our pride and get back to our standards. And that's what we do in the offseason. It's when no one's watching. It's the effort level they put in the weight room, the way that we condition. Uh, I mean, this was a very grueling training camp that we had. You guys came a day after a very hard practice, and I still thought they had a, a little bit left in the tank as we pushed them through that day that you were here. Um, so, you know, just really proud of the guys. You know, and, and now we're gonna—it's—it's it's one game, it's one win. Uh, it, it's significant and big because you get a chance to put a trophy in the case. It's a Big Ten West game. It's a Big Ten game. Uh, you know, now my sophomores and my freshmen—they've all now been in, in a bowl trip, so to speak, where you're in a hotel for an extended period of time. Um, you know, a lot of uh, distractions that are, are kind of at your fingertips, and they handled it, you know, really outstanding. So, um, you know, just all in all, just a great program trip, great program win, ton of lessons learned. Uh, but I would agree with you. I think on both sides of the ball, I think the job that they did in the weight room showed up, and now we're just going to continue to have to build and keep getting better as the season goes along. Yeah, no doubt. Won the line of scrimmage on both sides. Obviously, the run game, uh, run defense leaps and bounds better than a year ago. But as you said, hey, it's one game. And mm -hmm. so now you have the, the week off here to kind of reacclimate. Give us the game plan. Kind of how do you get everyone back on the, the ground, literally and metaphorically, and, and get them ready for Duke? Well, you know, today will be a work day for us, a, a, a quote unquote Sunday of a work week minus, uh, you know, the work after dinner. I'm making our staff go home for dinner uh, every day this week. Uh, but uh, the guys will be off today. We'll treat tomorrow like a Monday where we'll put the Nebraska game to bed. Uh, we'll lift, we'll condition, we'll do correctives uh, as far as things that we can be better at, better coaching, better teaching, better execution. Uh, and, and then, uh, you, you know, we'll start to turn our focus Thursday and Friday then to Duke 
I'll give the entire program Saturday off. And then, you know, to, uh, we're a Sunday off routine team. So our guys will be off Sunday. Uh, but we'll, we'll put together kind of our, our game plan here this week as a staff solidified after we watch their game on Saturday. And, uh, you know, we have to treat this one kind of like an opener again because of a new coaching staff, uh, you know, and, and obviously a ton of nuances with their personnel. So, uh, again, kind of like the Nebraska game where it was, you know, it was going to be Coach Frost's offense, was going to be Coach Whipple's. You know, how is it going to be combined? Uh, you know, our defensive staff had a lot of adjustment. Now it'll be on both sides. You know, as Coach comes from AM with his defense, Kevin Johns comes from Memphis with his offense. Um, you know, Pat comes, uh, you know, that we've got familiarity already with the special team. So we got a lot on our plate as a staff, but uh, hopefully put together a great plan. And then, you know, just get back into our routine next week. Again, still not in school, but uh, hopefully all of our fans, you know, our students will maybe a road trip to Chicago for one, uh, one, one weekend before school starts. Coach, I do want to leave you with the Big Ten Network anniversary that we talked about off the top. It was your second year as Northwestern's head coach when the network launched. What do you remember about those early years, and, and what way has the network impacted the, the job you do as a coach? Well, let's go back to that commercial you guys invited me to launch. I mean, I think I was 12 years old in that commercial. That was pretty bad. So did you, buddy. I mean, that was, that was fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, you know, from the start all the way through to today, I mean, we're not, in my opinion, we're not where we're at as a program without BTN, you know, and I appreciate Commissioner Delaney and all the leadership that went into making, you know, you know, a high risk, high reward move that's changed the landscape of college football. You know, you look at the expansion that's happened, you look at how different conferences have tried to emulate what you all have been able to do. But, you know, for Northwestern, th th this gives us a platform. You know, we, we were one of 11, you know, one of 12, one of 14, now one of, soon to be of 16. Uh, but we've played a ton of great games on the network. We get a ton of great stories told about our players, our program. That, you know, in areas that, you know, gets to, to describe our brand and who we are as a university and who our players are. And we're just so thankful and appreciative of that. We wouldn't have that without BTN. And, uh, you know, then you think about the practicality. I mean, I've had multiple guys go down and do internships at BTN with you guys, either behind the scenes or in front of the camera and, and all of our athletes. You know, so th this has just been a huge win for us as a program and, and as an athletic department and university. And just really thankful for the partnership. Uh, you know, we just want to continue to put uh, good product on the field. So you guys have a lot of good things to talk about, but uh, it's just been a great, great partnership. And we're very thankful. Partnership is the word for it, too. You have been a fabulous partner to us. Thanks for all of your cooperation through the years. Congratulations on the win. And thanks for spending some jet lagged time with us. <laughs> uh, sorry, this is a face better for radio, especially now. So I, uh, I appreciate it, Dave. And thanks, everybody, at BTN, for what you do. And uh, enjoy the football this weekend. We start off what big, big time football on Thursday with Penn State and Purdue. So fired up to watch that as a fan this weekend. So go Cats. Thanks. Thanks, Fitz. Thursday, Minnesota fresh off a nine win season, taking the field to open the year under the lights against New Mexico State. It's Big Ten football sponsored by Hampton by Hilton Thursday, nine Eastern Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. Wani, there's a ton of excitement about this Gophers team. We were very impressed when we saw them in yep. camp. What are you most interested in seeing from well, them? Well, I think there should be. I mean, the, the only concern I have, and I think talking to, to Joe Rossi, the defensive coordinator up there, you know, they, they, the linebackers are going to be solid. The secondary is going to be solid on defense. And we're talking about a top 10 defense from a year ago. Yep. The defensive front four, that's, who, that's where they've got to come up with players and playmakers. And, uh, you know, they've got some four-star recruits that they're going to try to get in there in, in, in the rotation. You know, they've got transfer players, you know, from two or three different schools. So uh, the defensive line is really when I – that's where I'm going to be focused. If they can get plays out of those guys, they're going to be really good. I'm looking at the offense holistically for Minnesota. you got Kirk Shiraka back in there, and that's been a main storyline throughout the offseason. But can Tanner Morgan return to form? Mo Ibrahim is healthy, and we yep. saw what he did in three quarters against Ohio. State in their opener a year ago. Can he be that same guy? And I think there's a lot of excitement. So everybody wants to see if it can be done. I think this is the first stepping stone. Yeah, that offense looked really good when yeah, we were there. They have did. some excellent weapons. And as well coached, too. And no doubt. And yeah. having Kirk Shiraka back makes 
all the difference. You think about fourth in the nation in passing efficiency for Tanner Morgan a few years ago. Quick thought, Illinois, Indiana, the other conference game, the Illini, biggest thing you'll watch. I, I loved it. I, I think it was a Brent Bielema, uh, Bielema offense. It was, they ran the ball. They were balanced. Their star, Chase, had, you know, had a big game. And, and the quarterback, Tommy DeVito, I'm a fan of this kid. This guy is better than people I think give him credit for when you look at his history at Syracuse. And he's been coached well up there. I think, I think they're going to be as good offensively as they've been in a long time because of the quarterback. Lines of scrimmage for Indiana. And we saw in week zero how important it was for the Big Ten teams that played. And I think it's going to be critical for this Indiana team to be really good on the lines of scrimmage. Guys, we wrap up where we started 15th anniversary of the Big Ten Network. Year nine for you, Wani. Year four for you, Joshua. Wow. What has yeah. it meant to, to be involved? It's been well, great for us to it, have you. It's, it's been fantastic to see how the, the network, how the station has grown nationally to me, being in Naples, Florida, and seeing it on TV, and now adding the conference, new TV contract. This, Stars pointing up. Young analysts got a chance, and I'm really excited to be here. I've been able to grow. I've been able to work with great people, but also watching some volleyball on Big Ten Network, one you of the things I enjoy. Big time I volleyball love it. fan. Versatile. It's versatile. Yeah, it's in full swing.